please give it up for Dion Flynn. Okay, hi everybody. Yes, I am Dion Flynn, and I do play Barack Obama on uh, the Tonight Show. Let's just face it though, I got the job because I look like if Barack Obama had a baby with the Grinch. <laughs> okay, good, so you're laughing, that's good. Now let's start the story. The story is serious and you know, don't laugh at anything I say in the story. No, I'm kidding. I was the only brown kid in my trailer park growing up. And really I was the only brown person in the trailer park because my parents were both white as well. So my, it's really complicated because my real mother, she had me with a black guy and then she found a white husband and they both raised me. So all the time that I was growing up, I had two white parents. I was very confused, very isolated in that whole situation. So I'm going to tell you the color probably of everybody. And when you're biracial like I am, you get to tell what color people are in the story. and You get away with it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, you have special uh, dispensation. Okay. So here's the story. Uh, things were tough enough, you know, being the only brown kid in the neighborhood. Uh, then my mom decided in like the late 70s to have a hysterectomy. Uh, I don't know if she decided, it kind of got foisted upon her or whatever, but it changes you when you have a hysterectomy. You know, it's like she, she went a little kooky. I, she, so she started doing some things that had some impact on the house. She had an impact on my dad, my white stepdad. He started to, whenever I would go to him and say, Mom's acting a little kooky, he would not give me much support. He would tell me, I guess to try to neutralize the fear, he would tell me something bad that happened to him. So I'd say, Mom's acting a little kooky. He'd go, yeah, well, they ran over my knees. Uh when I was working at Walsh's Lumber with a forklift. So I'm like, no help there, you know, basically is, is what I'm getting. And so, and my mom, the change that happened with my mom, she started taking us to horror movies a lot, like after she had her hysterectomy. I, all of a sudden we're going to see like Silent Scream with Yvonne DiCarlo and uh, The Shining. I saw The Fucking Shining when I was 10. This old lady coming out and her skin hanging off and Jack Nicholson and an ax to the belly of Scatman Crothers. It was too much for a 10 year old, but the worst movie that my mother subjected me to, and this is a tribute to the brilliance of acting and artists, was Betty Davis in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Fine, I can put this down now. I wish, where were you guys in the trailer park? You don't show that to a kid. She showed it to me on the afternoon movie down in Maryland. And it was, a sh I mean, did Betty, it, no one should be allowed to watch that performance. Though for the few of you that don't know, Betty Davis is like a child star in the movie and she, she, she abuses her sister who she blames for her life going wrong or whatever. And she feeds her sister a rat and her sister's dependent upon her and it's Joan Crawford and she's in a wheelchair and it's fucking hell, man. And she's so brilliant in this role that I was terrified. And so my dad comes home and I go, Dad, you know, Mom showed me this afternoon. She showed me, uh, you know, uh, whatever happened to Baby Jane. He goes, you know what happened to me back in the Navy? I, I mean, what they did in the mornings was they'd pick up the bunk and they would drop it in the Navy. The drill stars would wake me up. I'm like, get out of here. Forget it. I give up, right? So we have ice cream that night. I go to bed and uh, I'm in the bed and I'm seeing, like this is, this would go on for years, but this is the first night of this shit. I see Betty Davis's face like above me, like floating in the room in my trailer. From, and I, and I'm a mimic and I've always been a mimic so I could pick up words and remember them and the voice and everything. So. I, it was very vivid, and she's there above me. I've written a letter to daddy. His address is heaven above. The letter says, daddy, we miss you, and something or something other with love. Instead of a stamp, I put kisses. The postman says that's best to do. I've written a letter to daddy saying I. And then in the movie, she comes out of the dark and she sees how old she is. Love you. Ah! And she gets freaked out by her own visage, right? And she's got these little ringlets and these bows in her hair. And she's in a little dress, but she's old and it's really freaky. And I'm seeing that every night. And there's no hope for me anymore in the bed. And so my dad goes by to go to bed and I say, dad, dad, dad. And he goes to the bedroom, what? I go, um. That thing you were saying about the service, I'm just making up anything just to try to talk to anybody going by to help me possibly. <laughs> Dad, you, you, will I have to join the service? And he gets in the, that sounds like a good question posture. He goes, huh, will you have to join the service? I'm not sure, maybe. Good night, boom, and he's gone. <laughs> so I begin to masturbate frantically. <laughs> I had already known about masturbation, but this was the first night I used it as a sleep aid. 
and I'm afraid to go down the hallway because I know to the right it's Yvonne DiCarlo and I know to the left it's Betty Davis. I literally can't leave my room to urinate. So I urinate in the Lincoln Logs canister at the foot of my bed. Oh, but don't worry, the sides of that are made of uh, c cardboard, so it absorbed the urine and became a bloated uh, f version of its former self. As did I, after the next morning, my mom sleeps till 10, 11, 12, noon, she can't get it together, God bless her. These people are in their late 20s, okay, I get it. But there I am by myself, putting it together in the trailer. I go to the freezer, I open it up, I take the Seal Test Heavenly Hash that we ate the night before. You remember in the little square box? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Pull that out. I flip it over because I know I'm going to be sneak eating. I open the bottom, which is nice and good, and I start tunneling in and eat it from the bottom. You know, and, to, and it's like, I don't know, like the French when they're tunneling in and the, the English and they meet in the middle and made the channel, you know, and they probably like knocked, hello, are you there? Whatever. That was me. Like some fucking kind of squirrel or something at the factory, you know. I don't know what I was thinking, that they wouldn't catch me. Or so, I put it, so I flip it back over. I'm done eating. I put it back in the freezer. And just like Danny in The Shining, I cover my tracks. And I begin to get fatter and fatter and fatter because I eat all the time now. And I'm masturbating compulsively. And my head is getting foggy. And when your head gets foggy and you start to get fatter, you don't get along with kids, you don't do well in school, suddenly I failed the ninth grade. From age 10 to, I guess it took about till like 14, 15, 16, I failed the ninth grade. And this came up on my mom's radar of things that we should be alarmed about. She was like, <laughs> something's happening. I better get to my man my post. And she said, well, she said, uh, well, we're going to do something. And a little under two years later, she took an action. And she took me down to the recruiters. She took me down to the recruiter's office. At, down at the Tollgate Mall down in Maryland. And this, just so you get a visual, the Tollgate Mall is a wooden mall. Just so you can see it, it's like a mall made of wood. <laughs> I've never seen another one like it. So anyway, we go down to the recruiter's office, and this is a black guy. And she drops me off with this black guy. And he says, yeah, well, you know, can I talk to him? Because I said, I don't really want to join the Army. Your mom's sending me down here. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Can I, can, can I talk to him? Can you, you just? And my mom went off to Joanne Fabrics to go hang out for a while. And me and the guy, we start talking. Now, the guy was impressive. He was a black man. I didn't have any black authority figures, really. He had a, a mint green a short sleeve shirt on. It was summertime. He had these colorful ribbons, you know, here on his breast pocket. T nicely, like, uh, uh, ironed pants. And he had these shoes that looked like, I don't, like hardened tar. They were so shiny and, and patent leather. So I was like, oh, yeah, what? He was like, come on out here. Well, why don't we go outside here? He goes, and he took me to the parking lot. And he goes, you see that uh, 1986 uh, Cavalier? That brand new Cavalier? Uh, Chevy Cavalier? And I said, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you see the, with the government plates on it? Yeah, yeah, I see it. That's mine. <laughs> Uncle Sugar pays for the gas. You like that, don't you? And I was like, yeah, you'd like something like that, wouldn't you? <laughs> y yeah, I, I guess. You know what I do? What? I go around the schools and I try to recruit, recruit soldiers. And you know what else? I'd be looking at them girls up under them skirts. Yeah, you'd like that, wouldn't you? And I was like, yeah. Now, you might think so far in this story with as big a part as Betty Davis plays in my psyche, uh, and I really should have told you that the only thing that really pleased me during those years was being on stage and, and performing, because I did get into performance even though I was fat, and the only time I was happy was when I was on stage. When I was off stage, I was masturbating and eating, and I was miserable. <laughs> but when I was on stage, I was happy. So he's like, yeah, so you like that, wouldn't you, them girls? And I was like, yeah, you know, that'd be kind of cool, I guess. He goes, all right, all right, let's go inside. He, and he goes, you got any questions? We're going to sign the papers. I go, yeah, who's Uncle Sugar? <laughs> he says, that's Uncle Sam, man. Uncle Sam pays for my gas, man. Now let's go up in here and let's put you on a scale. He put me on the scale, sli sli slide, 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 249 pounds. He goes, nope, ain't no way we can do it. Ain't no work around for your height. You're too fat to join the Army. That's it. Let me know if something changes. Mom comes back, picks me up. We leave. I can't go to the Army. Something does change. I run away from home. I leave home. My mom loves movies. She does. She's a little more supine than before. She's in bedridden, you know, a lot of the time. But she does like these old movies. Gone with the Wind when it comes on. Whatever happened to Baby Jane when it comes on. Uh, uh, the Bowery Boys, things like that. So I run away to go to Hollywood, California. Basically, I run 3,000 miles away to try to be closer to my mother. My plan was to try to be a white actor from the 40s. I wasn't fully conscious of this at the time, but I tried to put it together. So I get out there. And I'm in Hollywood, age 17, 
and uh, I'm, I, I gained more weight. So I was about 280 pounds at this point. And I'm out there, and I'm on the streets, and I'm panhandling. I'm doing magic for people, and I'm doing all this stuff, trying to make money, hanging out, smoking weed, doing drugs. I meet a friend named Zigzag. And I suspect he named himself Zigzag. <laughs> He had a zigzag tattoo, but it was a black guy. And he had a, and we became friends. He was really mellow because he smoked a lot of weed, so we got along. We're hanging out in front of Man's Chinese Theater where they're giving out tickets to go see shows that they're filming, like they do in, in Times Square here. And they're giving out tickets to two different shows. Well, a bunch of different shows, but two we had to choose from. One was a show I'd never heard of called Married with Children, which was shooting in April of 87. So I was like, I never heard of that. I don't want to see that. And the other one was Our Magazine. <laughs> you remember that with Gary Collins. Anybody? No, not many people. Some people, who knows? A lot of us older folks, we do remember. But I loved Gary Collins. I knew my mom loved Gary Collins. I said, we're going to go to Gary Collins. So we get the tickets, Our Magazine, right? Me and fucking Zigzag get stoned to the bejesus belt. We come back, and we get on the little shuttle, and they take us over to the studio to watch the taping of Our Magazine. We sit down, fucking stoned, and I see the stage, and there's like two talk show chairs and a big poster, I guess, that pertaining to the guest or whatever. But Gary Collins comes out with his big corn-fed Midwestern trustworthy face, blonde hair, and he's like, everybody, welcome. Uh, our guest uh, is really exciting today because uh, we're going to shoot a five-part segment, all of them in one uh, go-round here. We're going to chop it up into five segments. Welcome our guest, none other than the legendary Miss Betty Davis. <laughs> they didn't fucking tell us that at Man's Chinese Theater, and I am stoned. And I am grabbing the bottom of my chair because I, I do not know what my body is going to do when this fucking woman comes out on stage. And she comes out, I'm bracing myself. I'm like, you got to be kidding me, Zigzag. You don't even know the half of this because I didn't tell Zigzag that my life had been ruined by this woman. She comes out on stage. She is a spider. <laughs> she is not, she is barely alive during this interview, but she is tough as hell. She comes out and she starts talking about how she doesn't like Faye Dunaway and how she wants someone to make love to her on a bed of gardenias. <laughs> and slowly but surely, I start to get it. She's more than just like a horror movie woman. She's like a real person. And my fear started to go away. My buzz didn't start to go away, but my shoulders began to relax. And by the end, I get to walk up to the rope, and I get to meet her, and I get to shake her hand. I swear to you, on, on my son's eyes. Let's put my son's eyes on the roulette table. <laughs> on my son's eyes. <laughs> I shook Betty Davis's hand. Now that's a hand. I've shaken a lot of hands since I've been in showbiz, but that's a hand that I, and I held her hand, her little gloved hand, and I looked at her eyes with a combination of, I'm in total awe right now. Thank you for helping me get over my fear. And I will take you down, bitch, if you make any sudden moves, because <laughs> I'm bigger. I'm bigger than you are. And so I lose my fear of Betty Davis, and it goes away, and I lose 100 pounds in the following 10 months total. I mean, I left home in February. That was April. I lose 100 pounds. Now, you could say I lost the weight due to the hitchhiking and cocaine plan I was on, <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. The final part of this story, just to wrap it all up, just to make you feel satisfied with the ending, I come back home and I join the army. I go back to the recruiter's office. You're in, 179 pounds I weighed, so it was 100 less than my top, but about 50 or 60 less than what he weighed me. He was like, you're on drugs, clearly. I was like, whatever, let's just sign and get in there. <laughs> he didn't care, he didn't give a shit, you know. He was just making his numbers. And so I went to the army. I go to the army, get to basic training, and two drill sergeants come up on my radar in basic training, Drill Sergeant Bell and Drill Sergeant Francisco. Drill Sergeant Bell on the first day says, and none of y'all gonna be going to the motherfucking candy machine. If I catch you by the off-limits candy machine, I'm gonna have your testicles for a necklace. <laughs> so candy is off-limits. And Drill Sergeant Francisco tries to imitate a lot of the black drill sergeants, but he's Filipino, so he had a little bit of trouble doing that, but he was, Drill Sergeant Francisco had a pockmarked face, was enormously muscular, had a dragon tattoo going up one leg and a tiger tattoo going down the left leg. We didn't find that out the first day, but we did later on. Uh, don't ask actually how we found that out. Um, <clears throat> and he would, uh, the black drill sergeants would go, well, uh, uh, you, you better do what you're supposed to do and don't fake the funk, private. And Drill Sergeant Francisco would try to imitate them, you know, try to get on board with them. You better do what you're supposed to do and don't you fake the punk, private. 
So he's in your face and you're trying not to laugh and you're, you're, and you're still scared. It's such a mix of fucking emotions. I shouldn't have to go through that shit. Anyway, six weeks in, I say, fuck this. I'm in, can I'm in masturbation, drug withdrawal, sugar withdrawal. I need something. I gather all the guys that say, I don't care about the off-limits candy machines. Give me your quarters. I'm going to the candy machine. I'm going to empty the thing. I get laundry bag. I go outside everybody's laundry quarters. I empty that motherfucker. <laughs> I took even the bullshit candy like chuckles that nobody ever buys. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Clean that bitch out and was on my way back. And Drill Sergeant Bell, testicle necklace, he goes, Flynn, where you, uh, where, where you coming from? I go, uh, the laundry, Drill Sergeant. <laughs> he goes, bullshit, because you came from around there. Get my office. Boom. Empty out the bag. There's all the candy. I'm totally busted. Get a parade rest. What the fuck are you thinking? I'm standing at parade rest. It's a modified position of attention. My arms are behind my back. Couldn't be more vulnerable. And I said to him, uh, I don't know. He goes, well, I'm going to go get Drill Sergeant Francisco. <laughs> and I was like, Jesus Christ, no, please, no. And truth starts to bubble up from my core, up my neck, and out my mouth. And I just say to him, I pull up my shirt. I show my stretch marked stomach, my saggy skin from having lost 100 pounds. I show him my belly, and I say to him, it just comes out. I say, Drill Sergeant, I said, I've always dealt with my problems with food. And I'm crying. This guy, with all that he knows about drill and ceremony, has no idea how to deal with a crying 19 year old man. <laughs> he goes, I'll be back with Francisco. He backs out the door and I'm there crying, thinking about the trailer and my mother and their struggles and her drugs and her imminent death. I mean, it appears at that point it ended up being that. Whatever, all the way through, all the way through, the eating, the drugs, the blah, 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 boom. He comes back and he goes, you know what? I go, yes, Joe Sergeant. He goes, why don't you just get on out of here? And I said, th th thank you, Joe Sergeant. For just one second, I made the eye contact with him and with the candy and with him that said, should I take that with me? <laughs> and he was like, don't even fucking think about it. <laughs> and I left, and that was how I got over my fear of Betty Davis and the drill sergeants. Thank you. You're the best. <laughs> Thank you.